Hi, good morning. This is Kathleen. Robin, am I showing the correct screen? Um, you have your next slide on the right hand, so you'll want to go down. Let me go to display setting real yeah. quick. How's that? Good. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining me here today. I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I have um, many collaborators and co-authors who have contributed to the work that I'm going to be presenting here today. So I'm sure all of you have heard of the Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, this is an invasive pest that was accidentally introduced to the United States from Asia. Pretty soon here in the spring, the adult Emerald Ash Borer beetles will be emerging from ash trees, um, feeding on ash leaves and laying eggs on the bark of ash trees. When the new larvae um, hatch from those eggs, they'll tunnel under the bark and begin feeding um, just beneath the bark of the tree. Uh, I've got to credit Joe Boggs with these next couple of awesome slides, um, reminding us of how this impacts a tree. So this is a cross section of a tree. You can see the outer layer is the bark where the ash borer lay eggs were laid. And the layer just beneath that is the phloem, and that's the layer where the ash borer larva feeds. Um, below that is the cambium that makes new cells, and then the sapwood, which is part of the xylem. Um, now the xylem layer in the tree is the layer where water and nutrients flow up the tree. And in diffuse forest trees like ash, or in diffuse forest trees, water and nutrients flow through many rings, so you see that. But in ring forest trees like ash, uh, what you'll see is that only one layer of the sapwood is active. And that's important because as the ash borer larva grows and gets into its large, larger instars, it starts to score the cambium as well as the sapwood of the tree and really disrupts all of those layers of the tree. So not only is the tree unable to transport sugars down through the phloem, it's um, having its transport of water and nutrients disrupted um, going upwards through the tree as well. Of course, as you get hundreds of ash borer larvae, thousands of ash borer larvae within a tree, all of those feeding galleries combined then cut off that tree's ability uh, to transport water, nutrients, and sugars, girdle the tree, and kill it. Since its introduction in southeast Michigan, um, probably in the mid-1990s, emerald ash borer has spread throughout the region and into areas of adjacent Canada. There are 16 species of ash in the United States. Um, five of these live in our region and all of them are susceptible to emerald ash borer. So I'm just gonna go into a few of the ash species that, that are native here in Ohio. Black ash is a species of the more northern distribution. This species typically inhabits uh, saturated soils like swamp or riparian ecosystems. And it can be, especially as you get further north in northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, it can be the dominant tree species in many areas. Green ash is a species with a huge um, distribution. Uh, it can live in a wide range of habitats, but it reaches its highest densities in a lot of riparian areas in Ohio. So we can actually have green ash as the dominant species um, along streams and rivers. White ash also has a very large range. Uh, this is typical of upland forests where it often occurs mixed with a number of other tree species. Pumpkin ash, Brachmus profunda, is a more southernly distributed species that inhabits wetter areas, swamps, and riparian areas. And finally, blue ash has a very small range. Uh, this is a species that prefers high calcium soils, um, like those near limestone cliffs in some of the riparian areas of Ohio. So the, with five different species in our state impacted, um, the impact of emerald ash borer are far reaching. So tree species, especially species that are abundant and have unique characteristics, can be foundation species in forest ecosystems, which have a large impact on the ecosystem in which they occur. So that structure of the tree um, can support, for example, bird species through habitat as the tree creates 
uh, the tree's branches create shade, the tree's foliage creates shade. Um, that has an impact on the other species that can live in the forest. Those, the leaves and the seeds of the trees provide a food source for insects. And of course, those insects form the base of food chains for birds. As the foliage falls from the trees, um, the chemical composition of that foliage affects the soils and uh, adjacent aquatic ecosystems, affecting the chemistry of those systems and providing food sources for detritivores and um, herbivores in the aquatic systems that form the base of aquatic food chains. As the trees fall and create dead wood, um, that creates new habitat as well for other species. And so these foundation species can have a large impact if they're affected by an invasive pest or pathogen. So how can we respond to invasive pests like the emerald ash borer? Uh, integrated pest management is one way that we can respond. And this is a strategy where you use a number of different strategies to achieve that central goal of economically and ecologically acceptable pest impact. So using preventative measures, cultural control measures, biocontrols, chemical controls, monitoring, which of course supports all of these other strategies, and then mitigating the impacts of that invasive pest. And I'll be talking today about a few of these different strategies that I've been working on, uh, resistance tree breeding, uh, chemical controls with insecticide, a lot of monitoring work, and also some genetic conservation work. I've been working on monitoring the effects of emerald ash borer on forest ecosystems uh, since uh, 2005 in Ohio. Uh, we have a number of plots spread across Ohio, about 150 plots. And they have, used to have uh, about 3,000 large ash trees that were tracked individually over time, representing all five of those ash species that I talked about and a range of different ash densities and habitats. Um, my monitoring methods are published in a GCR that uh, you can access online. We're going to zoom in on those three sites that are in blue there and talk about what happened within those sites. Uh, but first, we're going to look at the, the landscape scale. Um, so in 2005, when I began monitoring, so you'll see these plots kind of showing up over time and then disappearing. That's not the spread of emerald ash borer. That's the, the spread of my research funding to support the monitoring. And um, the plots in uh, white circles or, or blue circles are um, plots with very low mortality of the ash tree. So most of the ash trees are alive. As you get up towards the black diamonds, those are, those are sites that have um, complete mortality of the ash trees. So in 2005, things were looking pretty good. We set out plots ahead of emerald ash borer in Northwest Ohio. Um, you can see a few patches of mortality showing up by 2006. By 2008, there's pockets of complete mortality in Northwest Ohio. By 2011, that mortality had spread throughout Northwest Ohio and into some areas of Central and Southwest Ohio. And by 2014, uh, we had very high mortality in Central Ohio. I don't have the maps done yet, but I will say we went back out to these sites in 2019 and found, uh, went to all of the sites and found nearly complete mortality um, throughout Ohio. We also monitored emerald ash borer population dynamics in our sites using purple traps in a subset of the sites. So you'll see in 2008 in Northwest Ohio, we had pretty high populations of emerald ash borer. And in Central Ohio, um, we had some one site with a higher population, but most of the sites had pretty low populations. As the ash populations crash in Northwest Ohio and that food source is eliminated, you see the populations of emerald ash borer decreasing in Northwest Ohio, but increasing in Central Ohio. And then those populations decrease again in Central Ohio as they eliminate their food source. So as I said, we'll zoom in on these three sites, Wildwood, Stratford, and Barbie. On the southernmost site, uh, we began monitoring in 2007. 
And the green line is the ash trees, the percent of ash trees that are alive. So all the ash trees were alive starting in 2007. We started to see mortality in 2014. The purple line is the emerald ash borers. So we caught our first emerald ash borer on a trap in this site in 2011. And you can see the population of emerald ash borers slowly growing early on. Stratford is just north of Columbus on uh, 23. And when we started monitoring this site in 2007, all of the ash trees were alive. You can see a pretty rapid uh, progression of mortality of the ash trees. And by 2011, all of the ash trees in our plots, the larger trees greater than 10 centimeters diameter at rust height, uh, were dead. With the emerald ash borer populations, you see those populations growing exponentially and peaking at, in 2010 when we were around 50% ash mortality. And that's really typical of what we see in our sites. Um, we usually hit that peak of emerald ash borer at around the 50% ash mortality mark. Then you see the emerald ash borer population crashing um, because its food source has been eliminated. And finally, Wildwood Metro Park in Northwest Ohio um, most of the trees were fairly healthy in 2005 when we began monitoring. We had a very rapid um, mortality event, and by uh, 2010, all of the ash trees were dead. You can see that crash of the emerald ash borer population. But unfortunately, and we've continued monitoring in all of these sites um, over time, uh, the emerald ash borer population never really goes away. So it may blip down to zero in some years, but then the next year, maybe we'll catch one or two on a trap. So it's at very low densities, but it's remaining in that landscape. This is that same site, but instead of just one line for ash, I've divided it out into healthy ash in green, declining ash, so those are those trees with dead branches in orange, and dead ash in black. And what I wanted you to see here is that, of course, at the beginning, we start with mostly healthy ash in 2005. Um, by 2010, it's all dead ash. But in the middle, we have a mix in 2007 and 2008, a mix of healthy, declining, and dead ash. And that's also very typical of emerald ash borer. The trees don't all decline and die at the same rate. So it's very typical to see healthy ash trees as well as declining and dead ash. And we'll come back to that later because it's important um, in the ash resistance work. So what's left in these sites after the ash trees die? Well, we have plenty in Ohio, we have plenty of ash regeneration. So seedlings and saplings that were too small for emerald ash borer to infest or to prefer. And I've seen EAB exit holes in stems down to about a little less than an inch in diameter. Um, however, emerald ash borer doesn't seem to prefer those smaller saplings. It really seems to prefer them once they're about three or four inches. So those smaller saplings, and especially the small seedlings that are too small, remain. And those, are, those trees are growing over time. We have found that the seed bank is short-lived, some work uh, with uh, Wendy Kluster looking at the seed bank. Um, the bottom picture is a newly germinated ash seedling. So you see those long, spat-shaped cotyledons that are typical of, of newly germinated ash seedlings. We only see those coming out of the seed bank for a couple of years after a mass year. So we had a mass year in Ohio in 2008 before the ash trees died, and we saw those seedlings coming out of the seed bank in 2009, 2010, and a few stragglers in 2011. And then we haven't seen any more um, in those sites because the ash trees are, are dead in, in the majority of those sites. In sites that still had ash trees, mature ash trees that were alive in 2018, like the Allegheny National Forest, we had a mass year as well. So we're watching for those ash seedlings to come out of the seed bank over the next couple of years. So the implications for management of our monitoring work are that ash mortality and emerald ash borer population dynamics follow this really predictable pattern, um, which allows us to plan management actions. From some of the survival analysis work that I didn't show, we showed that uh, ash density doesn't um, act in the same way as some of these other um, systems. And so thinning and silvicultural actions are unlikely to slow that initial wave of ash mortality. The ash trees do become brittle and fall down rapidly. We can re continue to record those trees over time. 
Um, and that creates this pulse of coarse woody debris. And of course, I'm sure many of you know, it's easier to cut hazard ash trees while they're still alive. They're, and so planning is important um, to know whether you're going to remove trees ahead of time or whether you're going to let them die standing. We've also done a, a range of work understanding the effects of that ash mortality on forest ecosystems, and that's a whole other talk. I'm just going to give you a couple of the highlights right now. Uh, we did find some work with Kyle Costello and Charlie Flower that some native tree species can respond rapidly to ash mortality. We've seen from light measurements in the understory that if you have enough density of midstory trees, they can actually prevent the light from increasing in the understory. So that photo on the left shows a bunch of dead ash trees in the overstory. And then you've got this midstory with elms and maples, and those are rapidly filling in those gaps and preventing that light from increasing in the understory. And that's important because if you have invasive plant species lurking in low densities in your understory, a burst of light could facilitate those species. Uh, Brian Hoven um, has worked with me and shown that invasive plant species are in some of these sites. Uh, responding to ash mortality um, when you do have increases in that light level. So I'm going to move on and talk about our work on the survivor ash trees and ash resistance breeding. And I do have a number of collaborators on, on this work as well. Uh, so after we spent a day counting hundreds and hundreds of dead ash trees, uh, we found a healthy looking survivor ash tree right along the road as we were heading back to our car. And so after doing some more um, really intensive surveys of ash at a few sites where we, we saw some surviving ash, uh, we concluded that at a few of these sites where we have detected surviving ash trees, it's less than 1% of the larger ash trees that have remained alive. However, at a lot of our monitoring sites, we found zero. And so on the landscape scale, it's less than one in a thousand trees um, that have remained alive at these sites. The live ash trees that we find, like the one on the left in this picture, are often near dead ash trees, like the one on the right there, that were killed by emerald ash borer much earlier. So it's doubtful that EAB just missed those live trees. Emerald ash borer is really good at finding um, ash trees. But what's going to happen to those surviving lingering ash trees? Well, we know that emerald ash borer is persisting at low densities, so it could attack these trees over time. Uh, we're continuing to monitor those populations of surviving ash trees over time. And we've seen that many of those healthy lingering ash trees do stay healthy over time. Some of them die. Um, and a uh, postdoc who's working with me, Rachel Kapler, who's in the picture here measuring an ash tree, has um, done some really cool work showing that neighboring uh, ash trees, so ash trees that might be less healthy that are neighboring your um, ash tree, can actually have negative effects on the survival of the uh, ash tree. Rachel's also done some really cool modeling work trying to understand what's going to happen long term to the surviving ash population. And are there management actions that we could take? Um, those long-term dynamics, if emerald ash borer um, has a resurgence and we have mortality, mortality levels similar to that initial outbreak, um, there's a high probability of extinction of some of those ash populations. However, um, as she's done some modeling, there may be management actions that can decrease the probability of extinction of those remaining populations. And of course, finally, we're collaborating with uh, Jennifer Cook and Therese Pullen to test the resistance of those ash trees and to use those in a tree breeding program. So my next slide here is from Jennifer Cook. I've got several other slides from Jennifer as well. Why do we need a tree breeding program? So across the top here is a forest of ash trees. And the ones with S's are susceptible to emerald ash borer, and the ones with R's are resistant to emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer comes through and kills almost all of the susceptible trees. That's the little black X's. And so you've got remaining on the landscape these few resistant trees, but they're, 
they're very far apart, they may not be able to breed with each other. And the value of breeding programs is in preserving those valuable trees and bringing those trees together. And so I told you we were going to come back to this graph. How do we choose which trees to test for resistance? Well, timing is key, right? So if we selected those healthy ash trees to test in 2008, um, those trees are just the last trees to die. So that's too early to, to really start testing. If, on the other hand, we waited all the way till 2020 in this span to start looking for surviving ash, those small ash saplings and seedlings have had many years to grow and fill in some of those gaps. And we've, we've seen in some sites those trees growing rapidly. And so those would be larger trees later on that may not have been large enough during the peak of emerald ash borer to be exposed to those high pest pressure levels. So in this site, we would say that, you know, somewhere around 2011 is probably about the right time to really look um, for healthy surviving ash trees to test for resistance. So we've come up with these selection criteria for lingering ash. Um, 95% mortality of the mature ash trees has to have occurred at that site at least two years ago or four years after 50% mortality. The tree must have been large enough to be infested during the peak of AIB infestation. So in monitoring sites, um, at least four inches DBH. Um, if you're not in a monitoring site and you don't have as much information on when that peak may have occurred, we're um, suggesting 10 inches DBH. Uh, the tree currently has to have a very healthy looking canopy. Those are the ones that we've found to be most likely to survive over time. And we're only interested in naturally occurring trees. The planted cultivars that are often sold and planted in cities have already been tested for resistance and do not have good levels of resistance. So what does resistance look like? Well, these aren't trees that are completely bulletproof um, and unable to be infested. Resistance is defined as the ability of a tree to limit or partially limit insect growth relative to susceptible trees. So they may, they may eventually die even. They may simply live much longer than the susceptible trees. However, they can be improved further through breeding. So on the landscape, what this looks like is we have many, many susceptible trees on the landscape. That's very common. Um, there, there are some um, less susceptible, slightly less susceptible trees out there. Uh, in the center there, you see a picture of a tree that has had emerald ash borer galleries, but has healed over those tree galleries and survived. And so you see cracks in the bark. Um, that may indicate partial resistance, which is infrequent. And then very, very rarely, you may encounter completely resistant trees um, that do not have any, any damage from emerald ash borer. So what Jennifer does is she goes out and collects small branches from these ash trees and then grafts those onto rootstock in the lab. And what that does is it creates, uh, you can create a bunch of genetically identical clones of that surviving ash tree in the field. And that allows you to do testing with, with significant replication. So one way to test those trees is to simply plant them out in field plantings and let emerald ash borer infest them and compare um, mortality of those trees with the uh, susceptible trees that are planted along with them. And Jennifer's doing this at two sites, um, one in Delaware and one up at the Holden Arbor region. And the other way is this nifty emerald ash borer egg bioassay that Jennifer has developed, where she actually takes emerald ash borer eggs on coffee filters, puts them on the bark of potted ash trees, and then lets them um, grow uh, for eight weeks, and then destructively harvests the tree. And what we'll see is on the left there is what you see in the susceptible trees, right? You'll see a healthy, poor, thin starved large larva. But what you see on the right is what we see in some of these trees with resistance. Um, the ash tree actually kills the emerald ash borer larva. Um, another possibility is that it de decreases the weight of the larva. The larva may be alive, but it may be very small. So this is a sample of some of Jennifer's initial results. 
So the pie chart, each pie chart represents um, one of the trees. <clears throat> to the lower left there is the susceptible control, and it's completely blue because we got stage three or four larva in that one. Um, the orange is what we want to see. That's the trees that were killed, or the ash borers that were killed by the trees. And so we'll see that some of these trees killed a significant proportion of those emerald ash borer larvae. And one of the trees, PE42, um, actually slowed down the growth of some of the larvae. On the lower right, you see the emerald ash borer resistant Manchurian ash from China. So that one kills all of the ash borer larvae. So none of these are quite as resistant as that um, Asian Manchurian ash, but they may have enough resistance to have um, better survival. Now breeding, of course, allows us to combine the best genes from each parent. So if we have two trees there on the top, that both um, have some resistance to emerald ash borer, possibly through different mechanisms and different genes, and we cross those two trees, you can get all of these progeny on the bottom. And some of the progeny will look similar to their parents in terms of resistance. Some of them will be worse than their parents and will be susceptible, and others may have improved resistance to emerald ash borer. And this is exactly what Jennifer has seen in, a, in um, two small families that she's created from some crosses. So we, on the top there are the two parents that were crossed, um, and then all the offspring are the smaller circles below. So there are some that are worse than the parents, some that are like the parents, and some that are significantly better than the parents, including one that has, on the lower right, um, that killed a, a very large proportion of the emerald ash borer larva in the tree. So those results need to be repeated um, and, and studied further and more crosses made as, as we go forward, but these early results are really promising. So then the idea is that you would make many different crosses with different uh, surviving ash trees that have some levels of resistance. You would take the best progeny from those crosses and plant them together in a second generation seed orchard which would produce seeds with increased defense against emerald ash borer, um, but retain genetic diversity and adaptive capacities. So that's why you need many, many different crosses, many different genotypes going into one of these orchard plantings. And of course, those seeds could then um, provide material for restoration of ash species. So how can you help with this research? Well, um, when you get to that, point in time where you've experienced more than 95% mortality of ash trees, watch for and preserve any lingering surviving large ash trees that you find, and submit them to um, one of these databases. Um, we have a Forest Service database that accepts uh, submissions from um, some of the core areas of infestation in southeast Michigan. Um, there's a wonderful program, Monitoring and Managing Ash, uh, run by the Ecological Research Institute, and they actually do training programs as well as um, managing databases, both databases of uh, monitoring plots to understand when areas are at the right time point to look for lingering ash, as well as ma managing a database of any lingering ash that are identified. And then finally, there's an app called TreeSnap um, that is uh, very user friendly and allows you to submit um, surviving ash trees as well as other species that are affected by invasive pests and pathogens. So in summary on the resistance work, um, a small percentage of the ash trees do seem to survive that initial wave of EAD and of those survivors we do get some that um, remain healthy over time, usually the ones that appear to be really healthy and don't have any woodpecker feeding activity. Uh, Rachel's work has shown that some that neighboring trees may impact ash health and we're continuing to work to test those trees for resistance to emerald ash borer in collaboration with Jennifer Cook um, and determine those mechanisms of resistance. So we found initially that some trees have resistance to EAB and their progeny may do even better which is really exciting work that Jennifer's done. Um, trees with tolerance or resistance to EAB are then being used in Jennifer's tree breeding program. 
And we're hopeful that in the future there will be EAB tolerant trees that can be used in both urban and forest planting. So what can we do in the meantime while we're waiting for these trees? And that kind of leads into the next portion of, of my talk, some of the work that we're doing on conservation of ash genetic diversity. Uh, this is Charlie Flower, one of my collaborators. And um, again, uh, some of our methods here are outlined in the CCR. So uh, we've done a few studies, um, one of those being an insecticide treatment study at the Allegheny National Forest. And we have a number of partners on this study. <clears throat> both at the, uh, in the Northern Research Station, as well as the Allegheny National Forest and state and private forestry, as well as partners um, and at uh, multiple universities. So we had four goals for this study, and the first goal was in situ conservation of ash genetic diversity. And in situ is just a fancy word for preserving those trees on the landscape, as opposed to ex to conservation, which would be taking the seeds and pre preserving those seeds off-site somewhere. Um, our second goal was to tr test treatment efficacy of insecticide and test for this thing called associational protection. And then finally, to monitor the progression of EAD and ash mortality in this very different landscape than in Ohio. The Allegheny National Forest ha has extensive, contiguous forest um, landscape Whereas our monitoring plots in Ohio are small patches of forest, um, metro parks, and um, public lands and private lands in a matrix of urban areas and agricultural areas. So we were wondering if, if ash mortality would look different in this different landscape. Um, so we selected 27 sites across the Allegheny National Forest. Those are the little stars there. This is in Northwest Pennsylvania. And within each of those sites, uh, we treated uh, 20 trees with insecticide. So on the right there is one of those treatment plots. The blue dots are the treated trees. And then there are untreated trees in the plots as well, which are the orange dots. So the question about associational protection is basically whether those untreated trees in a treatment plot get any benefit, any protection from being surrounded by all these other treated trees. So one of our questions was, how do you get the biggest bang for your buck? You know, we, we preserved 540 trees across 27 sites, but what if you were only protecting 200 trees in 10 sites, or maybe you wanted to lump those 200 trees into four different sites? What's the best way to um, preserve the most genetic diversity for the least amount of money? Um, so Charlie led this work to sample leaves from 330 trees in 17 sites. Here's a picture of Charlie Flower. Um, so he, what he found from this work was that the um, best way to get the biggest bang for your buck um, is to focus on more treatment sites rather than more trees within a site. And to do genetic analysis beforehand, we worked um, with uh, Jeremy Font and Sean Hoban um, to do the genetic analysis to choose optimal combinations of sites so choosing sites that have different genetics so that they're complementary to each other. And by doing that, you could actually have a 20% cost savings, which really adds up over the years as you need to repeat these treatments every three years. Um, we found as well that the insecticide treatment um, of only 540 trees across this huge landscape um, conserved approximately 97% of the genetic diversity of the ANF. So we were really thrilled with that. So we're also looking at treatment efficacy. We're using imamectin benzoate as the uh, insecticide to protect the trees, and that's been shown to be one of the best insecticide treatments. But there are factors that might affect how well that treatment works. And some of the factors we're interested in testing is um, whether the tree is on the upper or lower part of the slope in this landscape um, due to soil conditions. The upper slope ash trees were less healthy to begin with. So you can see here on the graph in 2010, um, ash canopy condition is on the y-axis. Um, so a one is a healthy tree and a five is a dead tree. But the taller those bars are, the less healthy the trees are. So those gray bars are the upper slopes and they're um, 
higher than those lower slope <clears throat> bars, indicating that those trees were less healthy even before emerald ash borer came in. And we see that difference continuing even after emerald ash borer was um, causing some mortality in 2015. Um, we're also interested in looking at the effect of ash density on treatment efficacy. Our sites range in density from um, 26 trees to over 200 trees. And then effects on untreated trees, so that associational protection as well. Now in terms of initial tree health, we'd actually done some previous work. This was led by Charlie Flower um, at a site here in Ohio. And again, on the y-axis, you see the initial um, canopy condition of those ash trees, where one is initially healthy trees, and uh, fours were initially um, trees with a lot of dead branches, a lot of dieback. And what we found is after treating those trees, the trees that started out as a canopy condition one or canopy condition two, which was a little bit of thinning in the canopy, um, stabilized and generally did pretty well. The trees that were canopy condition three initially um, had a lot of variability. Some of those trees survived and some of those trees did not. And the canopy condition four trees that started out with a lot of dead branches, over 50% dieback, um, generally did not do well at all. So when emerald ash borer has already infested the tree, already created those feeding galleries, um, and has disrupted that uh, transport of water and nutrients, it also disrupts your transport of your injected insecticide. And so the insecticide does not work as well in those trees. So we're going to see if we get similar results um, at the Allegheny National Forest with white ash trees. This study um, with Charlie was with the green ash trees in Ohio. Um, so we're also looking at how ash mortality is progressing across the Allegheny National Forest. We began monitoring in 2010 prior to emerald ash borer. And those, um, we have 180 plots across the forest that provide a nice comparison to those ash treatment plots. So this is what it looked like in 2010. Um, the plots in green are healthy. The plots in orange and yellow are plots that have declining trees. And red are plots where, on average, the trees are, are pretty much dead. So in, even in 2010, we did have some decline of ash trees, and this was for reasons other than the emerald ash borer. And in particular, this was that landscape position issue where trees that were up on those upper slopes um, were less healthy. By 2015, we started to see emerald ash borer mortality cropping up on the southern um, side of the forest. Uh, by 2018, that mortality had moved through the forest. And by 2019, um, ash mortality in the forest was very widespread. Looking at those uh, prism plots in comparison to our treatment plots, you can see the prism plots here are in red. So in 2010, they were fairly healthy, average ash condition of two. Uh, and over time, those plots, of course, have, have declined rapidly. The treatment plots are the ones here in green and yellow. The treated trees that were injected with insecticide are in green, and the not treated trees in those plots are in yellow. And what you can see is that they started out the same in that first year that we treated them in 2015, but then those two diverge, and the treated trees are actually remaining healthy and um, actually becoming slightly more healthy than they were initially, whereas the untreated trees um, are a little less healthy than the treated trees, but they're doing better than the trees in the prism plots. So this is some of our first evidence that there may be that associational protection going on where those untreated trees are doing better uh, than those trees that were far away from any treated trees. Uh, I should say we, we haven't, we're gonna take another year of data on this and then we're going to do some statistical analysis to understand what's going on over that longer term with these treated trees and the, uh, and the untreated trees as well. In terms of implications of our insecticide studies, we've seen that that insecticide treatment can protect trees, especially when they start out healthy, um, and it can be used for in-situ conservation of ash genetic diversity. 
Um, the treatment results may also vary um, depending on that initial health of the tree as well as the tree's environment. Um, so I just wanted to uh, quickly summarize here. Many other scientists and I are all working on all of these different tools and strategies for managing emerald ash borer. And those strategies that we're working on may become even more powerful when they're combined in different situation-specific ways. So I'm hopeful that as we go forward, integrated pest management strategies will allow us um, to mitigate the impact and minimize the impact of emerald ash borer in both urban areas as well as forests. I just wanted to thank the many summer seasonal field crews that have made this work possible through their hard work, as well as our partners that have allowed us to do research on their lands and our many funding sources that have made that work possible. And with that, I can uh, take any questions. All right, thank you, Kathleen. I have one here. Um, does the proportion of lingering ash vary among species? The study presented stated that one in a thousand green ash survive. What about white or black ash? I noticed in South Central Upper Peninsula of Michigan, green ash have died off very quickly, while most white ash in the uplands are still very healthy. Yeah, so that, that statistic that I quoted is, the, is all of our species combined in Ohio. And so the species that we see showing the biggest difference is actually blue ash. We do see a larger number of blue ash surviving, but in, our, in Ohio, we saw very high rates of mortality of the white ash as well as the green ash. Um, I have, you know, I have read that in Michigan, we are seeing reports of surviving white ash that are large size white ash. Um, some of the white ash that are being seen may be ash that's, you know, in that core infestation zone where emerald ash borer has been for um, more than 20 years now, we may be seeing those smaller ash trees that were initially saplings now growing into that larger size class. So I think that's some of what we're seeing, but there may also be differences um, in different places in, in terms of what that rate of survival is on the landscape. All right. Um, is it possible to make interspecific crosses in Fraxinus? Yes. Um, and that was actually the first strategy that Jennifer Cook was using, was to try to do like the American chestnut program, right? Where you create hybrid ash species, breeding our North American species with um, some of the Asian ash species that have really high levels of resistance. So that may be a good possibility, especially for urban areas. But even with um, that strategy, um, the North American trees that you'd want to use may be these um, lingering ash type trees that have higher resistance to emerald ash borer just to um, give that resistance an extra boost in that breeding. Okay, um, as the treated trees showed improved condition after a couple of years of treatment, could that partially be due to reduced competition as the untreated ash die? Uh, that's possible. That's possible. We have had some of the untreated ash die in those in those plots. Um, so yeah, that, that's a possibility. Okay. Um, are there other questions, folks? Um, those are the last ones that I have here that have been typed into the Q and A and the chat pods. Um, I did want to say before we get off. Um, that tomorrow you all will be mailed, emailed a short voluntary confidential survey that we hope you'll take the time to fill out. Um, the email will also include Kathleen's contact information. For those of you wanting CEUs, there's information on how to obtain them for viewing this live webinar. So um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the Emerald Ashbor University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website as well. Uh, let's see, we have, Cliff says, great presentation. Thanks, Cliff. Um, again, Kathleen, this has been great information, a, a nice update for those of us who have kind of been following this 
of uh, the EAB situation here for years. And I have to say, I do have a live white ash on some property up in Northwest Michigan, while everything around, all the green ash around it are dead. So it's kind of, kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, but it yeah. Is. I'm really interested in understanding more about why, you know, why we're seeing that difference. And, you know, I know Jennifer has been working with Michigan DNR to, to get some of the white ash from Michigan sampled as well and into the breeding program. So those are being tested as well. Um, and that might be, you know, maybe that Michigan has a good source of, of resistance um, in their white ash. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, again, folks, oh, wait. Do you find ibidacloprid effective against um, rain? Is that rain or ran? Oh, against EAB. I'm sorry. Thanks, Jacob. Sure. We have not used imidacloprid in our studies. Um, there's a wonderful insecticide uh, treatment bulletin out that I know um, Dan Herms and a number of other people have put together. Um, and it does show imidacloprid as, as one of the effective treatments that a homeowner can actually do rather than hiring an arborist. Um, the imidacloprid I know has to be applied every year as a soil drench uh, rather than every um, two to three years like the uh, imamectin benzoate. Okay, let's see here. Um, you are getting some great presentation accolades here, Kathleen. Um, oh, uh, Cliff says imidacloprid does not work as well as imamectin benzoate, and imamectin benzoate can be applied every three years. That's from Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University. Okay, let's see. Thanks, Cliff. Uh, I think we are done here, folks. Thank you, Kathleen, again for coming and and uh, offering all your good information to us. And everyone else, thank you for your participation. I'm going to stop recording now. And